It's truly amazing uh, the number of conditions that respond favorably to cannabis. We're looking at an unexcelled wonder plant, herbal medicine that has no comparison. It would appear that uh, cannabis and hemp are one of the first plants that have been grown in agriculture. We came out of being hunters and gatherers about 10,000 years ago, and so that's at least the length of time that cannabis has been uh, cultivated. Cannabis has long been known as a medicinal uh, plant, as a medicinal product. The latest studies or the latest findings are a tomb in China in which the contents of the medicine bag of a medicine man were discovered and one of the things that it contained was cannabis. The tomb was carbon dated as almost 5,000 years old. The conventional wisdom which uh, goes to the oral history of China is that the Emperor Shan Nen wrote the first uh, Chinese Materia Medica and that it contained uh, cannabis. He is alleged to have written it in 2637 BC, which would be uh, almost 5,000 years ago. The oldest known copy of that goes back to somewhere between 100 BC and 100 AD. The oldest actual written record of the use of cannabis as a medicine is found in the writings of the Indian, as in India, Ayurvedic medicine, in which that uh, a piece of uh, history is dated at somewhere between 1100 and 1700 BC. Cannabis is found in every major Materia Medica that has ever been written. That includes the Ebers Papyrus from Egypt. It includes the writing of Descortes, who was uh, Nero's doctor and uh, his Materia Medica was used for over a thousand years. And it was included in the United States Pharmacopeia from 1854 until 1941. Marijuana uh, has been a medicine for a lot longer than it hasn't been a medicine. Evidence suggests that it was used in Northern China uh, for either shamanistic purposes, religion, or, or healing and the culture of cannabis as medicine moved uh, across the world. Um, India was very big in the use of marijuana and it was from India that W.B. O'Shaughnessy, who was worked for the British East Indies Company, picked up cannabis and brought it to the United Kingdom where apparently it was Queen Victoria's favorite uh, treatment for her menstrual cramps. Ultimately it came to the U.S. and in the early part of the 20th century, most of the major drug companies in this country were actually producing cannabis uh, medicines. Up until the beginning of the 20th century, cannabis was probably the second or third most commonly used medicine in the world. Uh, cannabis was found in uh, patent medicines that were manufactured by such uh, familiar names as Eli Lilly, Squibb, Merck, Park Davis, uh, Smith Brothers, you know, the Smith Brothers cough drops. Uh, and it was available uh, powdered, uh, chopped, uh, whole, and uh, as tinctures. It was only in uh, 1937 when Congress enacted the Marijuana Tax Act that imposed uh, a levy of a dollar an, an ounce for the use of medical marijuana that uh, was the beginning of, of the end for marijuana as a medicine in the United States. It was in 1942 that it was totally removed from the U.S. pharmacopoeia, or the formulary, but up until 1942, physicians could still write prescriptions for cannabis. So, you know, marijuana hasn't been a medicine for 68 years uh, in this country, but it has been a medicine in the world for 3,000 years. There was the uh, misconception uh, that use of marijuana led to uh, debauchery and physical violence and for that reason uh, I guess the investigator I, I guess we were probably more conservative than me right than me right now but that's hard to believe uh, so it was considered um, the way alcohol was considered back in the time of prohibition 
And so it was pro prohibited all uses of marijuana because it had been used medicinally as well as for recreational, recreationally. So all uses were um, declared illegal and marijuana then was given the status of a Schedule One substance, which means a substance without any recognized, any de demonstrable therapeutic effects, as opposed to cocaine, which was also uh, declared illegal for recreational use, but it still had medicinal properties as in a local anesthetic, for which it is used today, to this day. And that's Schedule Two. <laughs> When the Marijuana Tax Act was passed in 1937, uh, immediately Fiorella LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York, established a, an august body of scientists uh, to investigate whether the claims that marijuana use was going to increase mental illness and crime in the United States uh, were valid. And the LaGuardia Commission report was uh, issued in 1942, and they concluded uh, that marijuana was a, a good medicine and that the claims that its use would increase crime and mental illness were unsubstantiated. Prohibition cannot be enforced for the simple reason that the majority of American people do not want it enforced and are resisting its enforcement. That being so, the orderly thing to do under our form of government is to abolish a law which cannot be enforced, a law which the people of the country do not want enforced. Uh, that sentiment was uh, uh, repeated in 1972 when the Nixon Marijuana Commission uh, wrote their report. Uh, this was in the face of the admonition by President Nixon that they not uh, recommend uh, the legalization of cannabis for recreational use. Oh, there is a commission that is supposed to make recommendations to me about this subject. The recommendation of the uh, commission in its first report is that we do not feel that private use or private possession in one's own home should have the stigma of criminalization, that uh, people who experiment should not be criminalized for that particular behavior. Every 10 years or so, our government has sponsored another look into marijuana as medicine. The last one actually now being 1999, when the Institute of Medicine did it. And every 10 years, these august bodies come up with the same conclusion, that there is medicinal value to marijuana and its, its adverse effects and addictive potential and gateway drugness are overstated. And for some reason, every 10 years, these reports go, I don't know if they're ignored, but they certainly don't seem to change policy. In 1974, uh, a fellow with glaucoma who was going blind named Robert Randall uh, was arrested for possession of uh, marijuana. He had found that using the marijuana had diminished the symptoms that he was having, and it was later found by both Johns Hopkins and the Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA that this was the only thing that would preserve his eyesight. And the federal government then agreed to provide uh, Mr. Randall with marijuana for medical purposes. He had made an agreement, or the government thought he had made an agreement, not to tell anybody about this. Well, as soon as it happened, he told as many people as he could uh, and began to spread the word and people began to apply for this program which was called the IND program. At one time there were as many as 15 Americans who re were receiving 300 hand-rolled marijuana cigarettes a month from the federal government. Uh, and there were another 35 people who were approved for the program. In 1989 the first Bush administration decided that they needed to review this. They were concerned that too many people were applying for the program and if too many people got on it, 
the public might get the quote wrong idea that marijuana actually had some medical value, which of course it actually does have some medical value. Just prior to that time in 1988, the chief administrative law judge of the Food and Drug Administration issued a ruling recommending that marijuana be rescheduled from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2. In his ruling, he found that marijuana was one of the safest therapeutic agents known to man, and he stated that it was safer than eating 10 potatoes. So I've always been very careful about the number of potatoes I've eaten since then. Marijuana was widely used in the 19th century for the treatment of asthma. And in the 1970s, we found that uh, marijuana uh, has a bronchodilator effect. It's because of the THC in marijuana. First of all, let's contrast, or well, compare and contrast, marijuana with the other even more widely smoked substance in our society, tobacco. The tobacco was used more widely than any other smoked substance, and marijuana is second only to tobacco. Lucy? Yes, dear? Give me a cigarette, will you, honey? Don't say cigarette, say Philip Morris. Oh? Is there any other kind? Not for you, there isn't. Nothing but the best for Mr. Ricardo. Thank you. Lucy, you're so good to me. You see how easy it is to keep a man happy? Why not give your husband a carton of Philip Morris cigarettes? Smart move. He'll love them for their mildness, their smoothness, and their wonderful good taste. And he'll love you, too, for thinking of him. That's right. Good night, everybody. And don't forget, call for Philip Morris. Call for Philip Morris! We know that if you analyze the contents of tobacco and marijuana, they're quite similar. The major difference is that, that, that tobacco contains nicotine, not found in, in marijuana, and marijuana contains THC and about 60 other THC-like substances called cannabinoids, not found in tobacco. But there are other, a lot of other particulates that are shared in common, and these include carcinogens such as Ben's pyrene, the most potent of the carcinogens and considered to be responsible for a large percentage of human cancers. Uh, Ben's pyrene is found in 50% higher concentration in marijuana smoke than in the smoke from a comparable quantity of tobacco. And this has been shown by three separate groups of chemical investigators. So the uh, expectation is that if you smoke marijuana enough and on a regular basis that you would incur similar risks to smoking tobacco. So what are the major health risks for tobacco? Uh, emphysema, which I prefer to call chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's the new term, it consists of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. But you could have significant impairment in lung function without emphysema, it could just be due to airways disease we call small airways disease, but because we can't separate out the two components of COPD, emphysema, and the airways component, we, we lump them together. So that's COPD. So now COPD is the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. and in the world, and will become the third leading cause in 2020. So it's a very important disease. About 120,000 Americans die each year uh, from, uh, from COPD. Probably the best evidence for separating out, uh, the best method for separating out a COPD patient from someone else is to look at the rate of decline in lung function. I shouldn't say the best, it's the, probably the most uh, uh, informative. But it's more difficult to do because you have to make measurements every year for a number of years. And so you get a slope of the rate of loss of lung function over time. We did that. We actually measured lung function every year in uh, our marijuana smokers up, up to eight years. And we found that the slope of the decline in lung function was almost identical in the marijuana only smokers 